My name is Neil Murphy and I'll be the uh, moderator today. Uh, I'll be the little Dan on relative to this panel. Uh, you know, typically we talk about natural resource issues at this conference. We talk about conservation. We talk about those kinds of things as it relates to the Adirondacks. And we have a panel today that is very, very special. Because the panel today are going to talk about some issues that are really, really serious issues as it relates to the Adirondack Park and to our neighbors. And so it's, it's absolutely um, my pleasure uh, to moderate this panel on social issues in the Adirondacks. And we're blessed to have with us this morning to talk about poverty in the Adirondacks, Bill McCaugan. And Bill will be lead off this panel. And Bill is president and CEO of WCFE Mountain Lake PBS. And he has a very unique perspective as it relates to poverty in the Adirondacks. Our two, two other panelists that we're pleased, very pleased to have with us is Dr. Kathy Dove, who I think you all know is president of Paul Smith's College. And Kathy will talk to us about education trends and bringing up the end of our discussion, but a very, very important part of our discussion, uh, dealing with the health of our citizens in the Adirondack Park. We have with us Sylvia Getman, President and CEO of Adirondack Health. So we have three extraordinary panelists that again will share with us a different dimension that requires discussion and deep thought. Bill, please kick it off. Thanks, Neil. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank Dan for inviting uh, me to be a part of this panel. I think uh, uh, last year we were here um, on a different subject, and I just think this is a wonderful conference. So. Um, Mountain Lake PBS is the local pro public broadcasting station serving um, the Adirondacks and the Lake Champlain area. And um, we take our mission of storytelling and engagement here um, very seriously. And um, last year we um, were presented with an opportunity to uh, take part in a national initiative of several PBS stations called Chasing the Dream, uh, which was really focused, an initiative focused focused on stories and solutions about poverty in America. Um, you know, that's, a, that's really exactly the kind of initiative that fits into our mission to serve this region. So uh, we asked ourselves, what's the face of poverty, or more specifically, the faces of struggling families in rural areas like ours in the 21st century? Um, I can tell you on a personal level, I, I had an interest in this. Um, I'm, I'm a newcomer to the area. Um, my wife and I moved up here with our our daughters three years ago um, from the Boston area. We love it here. Um, but what I what I found surprising, I knew that you know there was going to be a change in median income and lower property uh, values. But what uh, I wasn't really prepared for was the fact that in areas like this, the day-to-day -day cost of living is so much higher than it is in the Boston suburbs whether it's gas prices, your grocery bill, um, your taxes that you're paying, there's just, a, it's more expensive to live in the North Country than in the Boston suburbs for everything other than purchasing a home. And I thought about that and said, you know, that's a problem <laughs> in this area with the, uh, when we talk about economic development. Um, so, uh, you know, and this is, it's exacerbated by the fact that we lack um, some of the uh, infrastructure like public transportation that you might have in some other areas. So we thought it was really important to take this initiative that was really designed to talk about poverty in a, in a variety of areas and mostly urban, and showcase what is the story here. 
you know, for us, um, it's really all about uh, partnerships. Um, we consider ourselves an education institution, but our principal role is convening dialogue. Um, last year, um, when we wanted to focus on uh, endangered and threatened species within our Adirondack Park, um, we partnered with wonderful experts throughout the region, many of whom are right here in this room. Uh, I see Nina. <laughs> Um, right here. This is this is an important part of us. So our, my first call was to a longtime partner of ours, the United Way of the Adirondack Region. They have expertise in this area, and we knew that they could help convene other important voices. And primarily, we were interested in talking to them because of the ALICE report. The ALICE report is a study. Um, the acronym is Asset Limited, Income Constrained, Employed. And and um, this is something the United Way has been working on in various communities. Uh, we knew that we had to go beyond what the federal definition of poverty is to really have a focus on this. In 2018, you can't tell me that someone making $25,101 in supporting a family of four is not in a precarious situation. Um, and the Alice report took a deep dive into what it really takes to support a household in uh, communities around the state of New York. And what it found was that an alarmingly large percentage of people in our area fall below that threshold. Um, that is um, people working in education, retail, service, home health care, um, nonprofits, child care, really a variety of people um, working um, in and around our region um, every day. So when we talk about economic development and we talk about you know, the potential growth of tourism in the area and all of these kinds of aspects, we have to realize that much of that infrastructure is going to depend on people who could fall into this category. Um, and what are we going to do about that? So. We wanted to utilize our ability to convene a forum and really bring in the people who can who can talk about this and really consider um, ways to not only explore the problem but explore solutions. So we worked with the United Way to identify additional partners. Um, JCEO, uh, Adirondack uh, Community Action, um, Plattsburgh Housing Authority, um, our State House delegation. Um, we had planning meetings to really focus on what the discussion would look like, what are stories that we would tell to go along with that, because we needed to put a face on these stories um, at how we would approach those. And we really, because, you know, in this day and age, we need to be more than a one-way television station. We need to engage on multiple platforms. How are we going to do that? And we had a great deal of online engagement. So this is the um, program, uh, just a snippet of the program that we produced um, just a few months ago. Their name is Alice. Alice isn't a person, but an acronym. Families that are asset limited, income constrained, and employed. Alice is the United Way's shorthand for the working poor. They are friends and neighbors we see every day at work, the store, or our kids' soccer game. They are people who have jobs, work full time, and yet they're struggling to get by. Many are just a single paycheck or illness away from financial crisis. Alice is the changing face of poverty in New York. So you drop her off there and the bus will pick you up there. Mm -hmm. With an active one-year-old, Megan Nelson has her hands full. She also works part-time 20 hours a week as a bus monitor. She does get help from social services paying for her rent for her apartment here in the city of Plattsburgh and her daughter Ava's daycare. But other expenses have to come out of her paycheck. And earning minimum wage often means at the end of the month, mm -hmm. there are tough choices that have to be made. It's just yeah. hard to make ends meet. Yeah. 
Definitely, it is, sometimes. And if there's no school or it's a vacation week, there's no work. If the kids aren't going to school, you don't get paid. Nope, exactly. And getting to her job is no easy feat. Megan often has to walk the two miles across the city to get to work. I couldn't afford my rent when I was pregnant with her. So the car that I did have, I had to get rid of so that I could pay rent. Taxis aren't an option probably. No, not with $300 every two weeks. I can't afford to put out like $100 each check to go towards a car. Does it worry you? Sometimes, yes, especially when it's cold out and I have to walk her to and from daycare. The Alice report um, really uh, provides a very different lens in which to view poverty through, a lens that has never been uh, utilized before. What we're seeing now is uh, working families, people that are employed, uh, that are struggling to make ends meet despite their efforts to work two and three jobs sometimes per, per household, yet they're close to the edge of that financial cliff where something like a flat tire or a leaky roof or a broken furnace, things that many of us take for granted as mere inconvenience, can actually be a catastrophic event leading to a tremendous uh, chain of events that could lead to homelessness, unemployment, and any number of, of things. So we've, we're seeing a very different face of poverty. And the Alice Report provides some uh, very enlightening and interesting data in which to view uh, the way poverty looks today. What percentage statewide and here in the North Country of families fall into this category? 44%, Tom. It's nearly half of every household. Who are Alice? Who, who are we talking about here? I mean, it could be any of us. I mean, Absolutely. you don't see them. They're, they're very hidden. You live in a rural part of Franklin County in Chattagay. Does mm -hmm. this surprise you or have you known that this population is out there? Have you been hearing from from these people who fall into the Alice category and are struggling. Um, but the numbers are certainly alarming, as John said, uh, when you look at them. I don't think there's a day that goes by in the New York State Assembly that we don't talk about income-constrained uh, individuals. Are the school districts helping out? Can they, are they providing free lunches and breakfasts to more and more students now that, that fall within the, the Alice financial category? We actually work closely with with many of the school districts across the region, and they're, they're doing a lot to support Alice households. You mentioned backpack programs. Yes. Let's, let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. A few years ago, a number of communities started that uh, here in the city of Plattsburgh, the three elementary schools. Uh, about 125 backpacks are going out every week. Every week, volunteers help pack up healthy meals and snacks. They get put in backpacks that are handed out to students at all three of the city's elementary schools. So the backpack program um, provides a backpack full of food for students in the Plattsburgh City Elementary Schools. Uh, we currently have MoMA, Oak, and Bailey. And um, the students are chosen, um, they're referred to the school by their teachers or by the principal for showing signs of food insecurity. Um, they do not have to have um, a certain income. And that's what's really great about the program is that um, for the people that are living above the line of poverty, they can still be helped by the backpack program. It's a great way to, you know, help people get through. They're obviously helping the community, but when you're actually packing the bags, you can see the difference that you're making. It's not like writing a check, which is also a great thing, but you're actually helping hands-on. And I think people get a lot of enjoyment out of that. They know how many bags we pack and if we're packing 100 bags, that's 100 students that, and their families that we're helping. I'm presently um, continuing work on the Alice Steering Committee, um, along with uh, many other uh, important organizations in town uh, or in the region, uh, including Adirondack Community Action Programs and Adirondack Action. Um, we've had related initiatives, uh, whether it be focusing on the crisis among dairy farmers who are facing these uh, similar economic hardships right now, our veterans coming home 
home project uh, focuses on uh, you know returning veterans and some of the issues that they're facing uh, right now and we're very proud that we just received three Emmy nominations and a New York State Broadcasting Award for those stories. Um, these are initiatives that um, we need to continue to do and more than just focusing on the problem um, to really seek out these kind of solutions um, together and that's really the um, the principal part of our mission of engagement. So thank you. Bill, thank you very much. Very insightful. Kathy, Kathy Dove is with us and Kathy will share with us trends in education in the Adirondacks. Kathy. Neil, you really should be doing this one. Can I sit there and you uh, you take this? Well, good morning, everybody. Um, it's hard enough doing a talk this early, um, especially after that beautiful video. And so I decided I wear this jacket just to keep you awake, <laughs> so you don't have to listen to everything I'm talking about. Just look at the jacket. Hold on one second. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure to, to uh, talk to you all today, and um, there's a number of people that are involved in education, including my wonderful colleagues at Paul Smith, so hi guys. Most of you always sit in the back, so hello. <laughs> um, it's especially interesting to follow Bill um, because uh, many of us believe, um, and, and this is um, a little bit about what I'm going to talk about, the role of education in, um, in addressing poverty issues is extremely important. And so what I'm going to talk about today isn't so much the Adirondacks specifically, but I'll just talk very briefly about nat some national trends, New York State, and then a little about rural trends um, with education, um, and then leave all the questions for later, um, where again I'll get pro hopefully uh, the help from people like Neil to answer them. So, let's see. I will use arrows. Um, so just a few educational trends, and I'm going to bounce around a little bit between trends um, that impact students um, and trends that impact educational institutions. Um, but there is some good news, and then there are absolutely some challenges. So on a national level, the high school graduation rates are going up, and that's critically important, obviously. Um, so it's about 82% right now um, across the nation, not, not uh, specifically in our, re in our region. And as most of us know, know um, or hear or read it's, um, higher education education, which is when people really start investing in education, still tends to be an excellent return on investment. So college graduates make about a million dollars more over their lifetime than somebody that doesn't go to college and graduate from college, and there's an annual income gap. Um, so it's a good return for most people, but as we'll see in a minute, um, there are still a lot of people that don't get through college. The demographics are really challenging um, for people in colleges and universities, and I'm going to talk about population a little bit more. Um, the high school population is shrinking, and that's going to go on for another 10 or 20 years. Um, and what's particularly of interest and of concern to those of us in higher education in the Northeast is that it's particularly um, aggressive uh, demographic in those two areas, and frankly, there are a lot of colleges and universities in the Northeast and in the Med Midwest. So so it's a pretty disruptive time to be in education. The other thing that's very disruptive and, and um, really interesting is uh, the change in who is going to college. So it's very much becoming more, uh, well, we're seeing growth in the minority populations versus the traditional college going population which tends to be white males. Um, so the result of that for colleges is over two thirds of private colleges in the last couple of years are not meeting their enrollment goals. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, um, but that's particularly exacerbated if you're a small rural college, um, like Paul Smith's actually. Um, Moody's, which does bond ratings for a number of different in, um, industries, has actually downgraded the entire sector to a negative outlook. Um, now that's not just for small rural schools, that's for everybody. Um, they're seeing these trends and, you know, it's a combination of affordability and uh, shrinking uh, um, traditional college going population, et cetera. So again, very, very disruptive time if you're in education, which can be exciting. 
This is um, high school graduation trends, and this is again across the U.S. And what you'll see is the uh, graph on the far left um, is reflective of what I just said. So on the far left is the Northeast, then you see the Midwest. Now, if we were in the South or the West, um, we would see a different picture. But right now, um, the Northeast is, uh, is seeing a shrinking population, and that's where colleges like Paul Smith tend to um, tend to get our uh, populations from. I touched on the fact that race is really changing. So this is K through 12 enrollment by race, and the top line, and I know it's hard to read, is the white population. Um, the the um, most aggressive growth you're seeing is in Hispanic. So this is uh, white college going um, students, and um, the, on the right side is Hispanic. And again, small numbers, but you can see the growth rate. And why this is important, and I'm going to touch on it in a minute to us, is because this is a population that isn't in the Adirondacks. Okay, so what does this mean for rural areas like ours? We're facing a declining population. I'll show you a few graphs in a minute, but I bet everybody in this room knows that. We're facing an aging population. Um, we don't have a lot of diversity in the area. So what's happening is there's a brain drain, and there's also low educational achievement. And um, the reason I'm touching on the college-going population is if we want to change some of these things, higher education not only attracts people to a region, but it keeps smart, educated people in a region who end up being your population of the future and those folks um, that are prepared to deal with poverty-like issues. And I will show you a slide on um, economic, um, economic um, achievement based on educational levels. So this is where I just said, and again, I'm sure all of you have seen this kind of slide. On the left, you're seeing the overall population change, 2010 to 2016. So uh, the blues are good and um, the, the pinky, reddy, whatever the color that is, um, is where we're losing population in the state. And then on the right is the high school going population. Um, and again, uh, blues are good, but if uh, you look at our region, um, you're seeing a lot of disturbing trends. And this is a little bit more legible, but North Country is listed there. And if you look at the uh, column on the far right, we have the biggest population, negative population change um, between 2011 and 2016 of all these major regions. So this is clearly of concern. Urban versus rural educational achievement is also um, interesting, and this is the U.S. This isn't just our region. We're holding our own. The top bar um, is, uh, I'm sorry, the bottom bar is less than a high school diploma. Um, so you've got 36% plus 15%, somebody help me with the math, um, about 50%. Um, of our high school, of our, of our children get through high school. And we're holding our own on that. But what's disturbing is only 19% in urban areas have bachelor's degrees or higher whether, um, versus 33% in urban areas. So again, big gap between urban and rural. And it shows, it reflects in our um, income levels. So this is the impact of education, which ties a little bit to what Bill was saying, but this is unemployment. So um, it's, go, it, it's trending down. The economy is a little bit stronger than it used to be, certainly. But if you look at um, uh, uh, the, the gap by um, educational level, you can see clearly less than a high school diploma um, is a huge gap, um, creates a huge gap for unemployment versus a bachelor's degree, which is uh, the, the bottom light blue bar. And this is a return on investment, okay? So again, um, the light blue is urban and the dark greenish teal color is rural. So we're, we fall behind the urban areas, but still the value of higher education is obviously clear. So this has got to be a priority of all of ours to address poverty issues. All right, so now I'm going to flip to New York State, and some of these are national trends, but we obviously operate in New York State, and uh, some of these are specific to New York State. So um, part of the challenge is getting students to go to college, and then the other part is getting them to graduate. And there are, good re there are many reasons why students do not complete, but it's a huge issue. So students aren't graduating right now, even if they start. 60% of the students in four-year schools in New York State don't graduate. 20% 
um, I'm sorry, 60% complete in four-year publics, 20% complete in two-year publics, that's community colleges, and about 70% in four-year private schools. So very disturbing trends. It's almost worse, in my opinion, to start college, start t uh, getting into debt and not completing and having that degree than to not go at all. But it's a significant issue. We're also facing the demographic shifts that I talked about. The New York City area is still growing in population, but the rest of the state is sure challenged. Um, public versus private funding models is a big issue in New York State right now for colleges. Many of you may have heard of the uh, Excelsior free tuition program that the governor rolled out last year. Um, it's a real challenge for private colleges who, per, who have a much better completion rate um, to compete with public education when um, middle class students, often the working poor, are um, given free tuition. Um, so it's, it's a huge issue for private colleges right now. The cost of education is a national trend. Um, it's both real and perceived. We have this crazy pricing model where um, the, attending college, particularly if you're income challenged, is not nearly as expensive as people think. Um, financial aid is pretty significant. But the way um, we talk about it, especially for our first generation students who don't always understand you can get a lot of financial aid, is they see it as a barrier and I can never afford college. And, um, and, and we, we in that industry need to work on that. The the relevancy of education to future careers is something um, somewhat unique to rural areas because I think there's there's a, a sense often that I don't need a degree or I'm not going to get the return on investment because often our salaries aren't as high. And if you flip back to the previous slide, you're still making a lot more than if you didn't get that degree, but the perception is it's not a good investment. And again, that's an educational process we need to go through. So why is this critical for our region? Um, I touched on this. Um, it's funny because Bill said he's been here, what, three years? Sylvia, you've been here two? I've been here three and a half, and all of a sudden, I'm the most senior person here, and I'm feeling like, oh my god, I'm still learning about this region. Um, but uh, many of you know, I came from actually an amazing project in New York City, which is growing population, which has huge incomes, which seems to be thriving. And the role of the, what I did in New York City was I was leading a project to create a new college campus down there that the city desperately wanted because, for economic development reasons. They understood the importance of a college or a university in attracting and retaining smart, young, eventually educated people to the region. It is our lifeblood. So we absolutely need to be focused on the role of high school, of K-12 certainly, um, but also college and university education in our region to attract and retain young people. Um, I, I touched a little bit on income levels. I'm not going to talk about it anymore. I also want to touch, though, on the role of colleges and universities. Um, many of my colleagues are here. They do amazing work for the region in environmental work, in economic work. Um, you know, we need to keep supporting that. So the overall economic impact is pretty significant for colleges. Our mission reflects that. So if you look at the third bullet, um, we believe in this. We know it's important for colleges like Paul Smith to be focused on trying to, um, to fix this issue and get more young people here. Our enrollment, our enrollment is challenged. And we are not alone. Um, we want our enrollment to be around 1,200 students. That's a good sweet spot for us. We're deliberately small, and we want to stay deliberately small. I'm talking about full-time, you know, kind of traditional students. We have others, too. Um, we are around 800 right now. So this is an issue. We have got to get uh, more young people into the region. What do we need to address? Um, we can't do this alone. First one is affordability. Um, that's not just explaining the financial aid system, but that's getting support, both private and public support for education. Um, we need to it, um, address retention and graduation rates. I showed you some horrendous numbers, which shocked the heck out of me when I first started looking at this. Um, schools like Paul Smith do help students succeed, but we all need to do that, because it, it really doesn't do them much good if they start and don't complete. Um, partnerships, um, we believe in that up here, and, and you all are role models in this. Um, 
especially in areas like ours, we can't do this alone. And you need scale, right? You need scale to make a difference. And so the more we work together, whether it's between educational institutions, whether it's between the hospital and, and schools like Paul Smith to get young people here and people interested in health fields, I mean, many partnerships. And often many of us are talking about that um, in, in significant ways. Relevant degree programs for the region. We at Paul Smith try and keep asking ourselves, what's important to the region so that when students get these degrees, are going to not only want to stay, but have opportunities to stay. Personalized education. Um, many students, especially those um, that we attract and others like us attract, really needs, need hands-on, personalized, help you through the educational process. And they do amazing things when they graduate. Um, again, our, our colleagues here focus on that a lot and do a great job. Diversity and inclusion is something many of us talk about up here, and there have been, there's been some good work we need to do a lot more. We, um, for both pedagogical as well as population um, reasons, um, are attracting wonderful young people with very diverse backgrounds to this region. It can be really tough if you are not used to a rural environment, if you are of color. Um, th you know, these are populations that um, we don't necessarily always support in the ways we need to to make them feel um, comfortable here and to thrive here. So that's, that's a challenge for all of us. And finally, marketing of the region. Um, you know, what's wonderful? We all get what's wonderful about being in a rural place um, like the Adirondacks, so special. Um, we need to attract and retain and help these young folks. That's what's going to break some of the poverty cycle, and that's what's really going to ensure that this region thrives going forward. So um, I'll save everything else for yeah. questions. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we also have with us uh, Sylvia Getman, Getman, who will talk to us, who is uh, about rural health. That's the third piece of this equation. So, Sylvia, pleasure. Great. Well, first of all, thank you all for uh, uh, for the invitation. Um, uh, I was sharing, you know, one of the thoughts uh, uh, that uh, Dan brought to us was, you know, think back 25 years and, and where are we today uh, in the Adirondacks? And as Kathy said, uh, I've only been here two years, so this has been a great learning opportunity for me as well, so thank you for that. Um, as uh, they mentioned, I'm the President and CEO of Adirondack Health. If you're not familiar with the organization, and I know many of you are, uh, we actually cover kind of end-to-end -end, uh, 50 miles of the Adirondack Park from Keene uh, to Tupper Lake. Um, we are the largest private employer in the Adirondack Park, um, and so I wear both of those hats in terms of a healthcare provider um, and also an economic uh, uh, entity uh, within the park. So. Um, I'll kind of zip through. There's a lot of d data on these slides because uh, healthcare, uh, if you haven't heard, is kind of a complex entity, uh, and, uh, and so there's a lot of different pieces that we could kind of grab on that. But as I was looking back, uh, I was really thinking. Actually, in 1993 is when I started in rural healthcare, not in the Adirondacks. Uh, I really walked into. I wasn't a CEO at that point. I'd been in large academic medical centers prior to that, and so walked into my first uh, rural hospital in Iowa uh, in 1993. And interestingly enough. Uh, I was kind of thinking back to, well, what did that look like here? So I have a very clear memory of what I, what I saw there. Uh, so I dug out the old board books at Adirondack Health uh, and spent way too much time reading through all the minutes of uh, what was going on. But what struck me were these were actually top uh, discussion items for the board in 1993, right? So uh, physician recruitment to the area. Uh, they were getting a new MRI. It was a mobile MRI at that point. Uh, they were doing some construction in and around buildings. Uh, they just uh, were looking for, obviously, from, for some staff, they had issues with their uh, heating and cooling systems at the hospital. They were talking about how do we move away from just measuring performance to really improving performance and quality of health care. They had just put out a new vision statement. They were doing strategic planning. Uh, and uh, they just starting the dental clinic uh, in Lake Placid. Um, and so what was a little sobering for me is uh, I thought I could just go change the date uh, on the top of that slide. Because I can tell you uh, my last board meeting, <laughs> uh, literally, we're talking about physician recruitment. How do we 
actually uh, attract and retain uh, the medical staff that we need here in the Adirondacks. Uh, we're getting a new MRI as part of our building project. I'm not even joking. I was just like, what? Uh, and uh, construction update, many of you know, we have a couple uh, projects, uh, also economic development projects, about a $20 million project in Lake Placid and another $20 million in Saranac Lake. So we're in that business as well. Um, and believe it or not, we actually just hired a new materials management <laughs> director. So I was like, oh, this is a little deja vu uh, on that. Um, so I did a little bit more looking around, you know, so what kind of things were we addressing in healthcare uh, in the Adirondacks? I remember back then we were predominantly hospitals. Uh, we are now really little uh, health systems. Um, but if you look at our, you know, we, we uh, group things in, uh, we call them DRGs, diagnosis related groups, uh, but you can see major joint replacement, uh, heart failure, stroke, pneumonia, and COPD. And then if you look at 2017, uh, major joint replacement, uh, sepsis, psychosis, a little different uh, flavor of what we're seeing in health healthcare uh, overall, and we can talk a little bit about what I consider an epidemic of despair uh, in rural communities that we are seeing and dealing with as well. Um, and then uh, respiratory failure and simple pneumonia, which if you don't know, is really not that simple. <laughs> it's uh, it's a, a serious disease. But the average length of stay uh, 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 for major joints, I think, indicates that even though we're dealing with very similar disease processes, the way we deal with them in healthcare certainly has changed. So uh, average length from 12 days down to three, uh, and actually a lot of people are in and out in two days uh, for major joint replacements uh, today. So, so similar uh, health issues. Um, and then I looked at, again, what are the similarities? What are the issues and challenges that we continue to try to address in rural health care? And I have to also self-disclaim that I am a passionate advocate for rural health care. Rural health care is a different thing, and it's an important thing. Uh, and so uh, you'll hear that kind of woven throughout uh, my discussion here today. So certainly we know we've had a lot of changes in technology, um, a good and a uh, uh, impactful, good, I think predominantly good, uh, but certainly disruptive technology. Um, how we're organized and where we are has changed dramatically. Um, how we're organized to do our work, uh, the rate of growth of health spending, I'll show you, you know, the old shocking uh, uh, rate of uh, growth compared to GDP uh, for the healthcare spend nationally that has really driven uh, all the redesign that you're seeing around the country, recruitment and workforce challenges, uh, and then concern over affordability. This is really from the facility standpoint, but I'm also going to talk from the patient uh, and community standpoint as well. So um, I put these up just because uh, when I first walked into my hospital in 1993, Washington County Hospital, uh, I had one of only two computers in that hospital, uh, and that was a PC. The other uh, department that had it was the pharmacy. Uh, so we've changed just a little bit uh, in terms of that. Um, and then up on the uh, upper right, uh, you'll see a CT scanner uh, uh, circa 1993, uh, and then uh, we actually just brought a new CT scanner this year uh, as well. Now, the interesting thing when I looked at these, though, is really the cost of this technology uh, technically has actually gone down. Uh, hard to believe, right? So to, to uh, outfit uh, organizations with the PCs, the big clunky ones in every in, in every office, uh, was actually, but the difference was uh, the capacity uh, and the uh, uh, the ability, um, you know, we live on our phones, uh, the, the power that was in our my phone today far outstripping what I had on my desk uh, back in 1993, uh, and the same with the uh, the CT scanner. That's actually a single slice CT. Um, many of you know they don't actually slice people. You know that, right? But anyway, there. Uh, and the bottom is a 62 slice. Um, and uh, the top was a 1.1 million dollar purchase back in six, in uh, 93. Sorry, not 63, 93. Um, and the bottom would, it cost us about 780 thousand uh, for that piece of equipment. So so there have been some increase. Uh, I think advantages in technology as we go along, uh, but it's certainly a disruptive change for us. The number of distribution facilities, rural health, if you don't know, is in crisis nationally. Um, and uh, we really, uh, in 1993, uh, it was just at the end of the farm crisis in the 80s, uh, predominantly through the Midwest, but not only the Midwest. We were just talking about the dairy uh, uh, crisis uh, that's here. So everything old is new again, right? Um, and so hospitals started closing at, ra at rapid rates, uh, which spurned kind of some new models of healthcare. Critical access hospitals came on uh, board. 
uh, in, uh, and uh, um, freestanding emergency departments, uh, federally qualified health centers really start taking off like Hudson Headwaters here in New York. Uh, and so they really were trying to address uh, this uh, hospital closure uptick that we had in the 90s. Um, and the, the challenge is uh, we're seeing that crisis again in rural health care. So uh, last year, for, actually it's now 44% of rural hospitals nationally lost money. The median loss was a 6% margin loss uh, to those hospitals. And currently they've identified that 673 are in the same situation of the ones that 79 that closed uh, on that. And uh, the, the challenge for, I think, rural health care is we're not just health care providers. We are economic engines uh, for the community. And the reason I'm so passionate about rural health care is because I love living in a rural community. And I can guarantee you this is not the same community without access to health care. Now, a number of the closures, quite frankly, were really transitions, transition to a different model, uh, right? So, uh, and actually two of these, uh, and I have a, a photo here, these are hospital closures since 1993 in the state of New York. Um, and you don't see the Adirondacks because actually Lake Placid and Tupper Lake uh, hospitals had already transitioned at that point. They transitioned in 91 and 92. Um, but uh, we actually estimate there's about uh, uh, one to two thirds less hospitals depending on what state you're in. And some of it for good reasons. But the trouble is it wasn't done uh, necessarily rationally. Uh, we call it uh, choking off the oxygen and seeing who passes out first, right? Not a great way to distribute health care across the country uh, overall. The other thing that's happening then is merger and acquisition. We are in an M&A frenzy in healthcare. Uh, it started in the 90s. They called it a frenzy then because there were about 24 uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, per uh, month uh, going on uh, or per year through that decade. Uh, we're up to 80 to 100 uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, per year uh, and it's increasing. It's accelerating as we try to figure out how do we organize better uh, to meet the needs of our communities and, and it does con continue. Um, so in 1993, again, back, back to the future, uh, it was when uh, President Clinton first uh, proposed health care reform bill, uh, which did not make it uh, th through the Congress. Um, but it really did spurn this, uh, the whole transition to managed care and really kicked off uh, a significant change in our industry, uh, which is the move from volume to value. So getting re uh, rewarded for not so much doing more to you on a per basis, but really looking at the outcomes. Did it work? Did, uh, are we keeping you healthier? Uh, and it really moved us from health care right to health, uh, which I think was an important uh, change. We learned a lot through the managed care uh, uh, episodes of the 90s. Uh, I did live through that. And uh, uh, we learned lessons, which is you can't focus on just one side of this equation. So if you see lower costs, uh, that's one, uh, one piece. Uh, but you have to bring value or actual care and outcomes to the patients. And that was a painful lesson that we learned in health care uh, through uh, the managed care uh, episodes and as we've uh, kind of uh, addressed that. So the real driver uh, for federal and state complete transformation, and I have to tell you, I've been in the business for a while, uh, and uh, this past year is the first time I heard my colleagues use the word chaos uh, in our industry. Uh, it has been a remarkable time. Um, who knew that I would actually be a, a, a slight fan of the, the president of North Korea because he's bumped health care off the media just briefly uh, in terms of uh, every day uh, getting up to see what uh, had changed in my industry. But it was really driven by this challenge. The challenge is we have a healthcare system, A, that's complex, B, that's poorly organized, and C, that we cannot afford uh, on that. And those of us that work in uh, healthcare know that better than anyone. So, so if you see that uh, spike up, actually you can see uh, the managed care uh, uh, did a little bump right around 2000. We were actually kind of uh, able to uh, decrease the rate of spending um, in healthcare as we went forward, and then it's uh, gone subsequently from there. But it's not all doom and gloom uh, for us. We've actually made some strides in this. Uh, organizing in what we're calling accountable care organizations uh, really has started to decrease the rate of increase, if that even sounds like a goal, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, it is. Uh, so if you look down, you know, from the double digit uh, rate increases uh, or growth and in spending increases of the 90s and early 2000s, we've been able to drop that at least to single digits. Uh, 
uh, and, and we're really actually seeing some of the needles move, um, but at the same time, uh, again, I, I direct you to the same issues that we were dealing with in 1993, we haven't solved the problem. Um, we still have a long way to go, and that's why you hear all these experimentations going on in, uh, in our industry uh, in and around uh, know the Medicaid reform, Medicare reform, insurance market reform, all trying to really figure out how do we do this differently uh, on an ongoing basis. So workforce shortages, uh, I think we talked a, a little bit about, you know, uh, uh, trying to attract people to the Adirondacks is a challenge. Um, we uh, have the fastest growing um, uh, professions in the industry, uh, but without uh, the education uh, uh, drivers behind us, um, I, we really struggle in order of meeting the needs that we have uh, for taking care of the patients that we have today. Um, Physician shortages as well. Uh, we are a physician shortage area. We mint a lot of physicians out of New York City uh, uh, hospitals and medical centers. They typically aren't looking to practice in rural areas. And we do have some great opportunities to bring them up, show them why this is a great place to practice, uh, and uh, show them that, uh, you know, we used to be the frontier of medicine in rural health healthcare. I really think we're the front line because I can tell you your ultimate outcome is improved by the first hands on you. Uh, and we know that to be a fact and we have data. So um, so the demographic challenges I'm going to touch on very lightly. I was very pleased that my colleagues went before because the reality of it is if you look at all those determinants of health, right, that you would have, uh, I think this is this is a very startling slide to those of us in, uh, in health care. Because if you look at clinical care, all the things I can do to you and for you will only impact about 10 percent of your overall health uh, on an ongoing basis. So, you know, when I'm sure when you thought, uh, why why am I coming to a conference that's going to talk about healthcare? If you look at the impact of the physical uh, environment, uh, if you look at all those things uh, that are behaviorally rated, uh, related to that, uh, this is a bigger picture. This is a conversation that we all need to be in. Um, and if you look at the, the different components, again, healthcare system is on the far right, and a big component of that is insurance uh, coverage, right? So that's not even uh, under the purview of the healthcare system in small rural areas. But if you look at economics, stability, uh, employment, uh, living wage, uh, if you look at our physical environment, uh, housing, transportation we know is an issue, walkability, this is a lovely area, it's hard to get around in the winter, it's hard to get around if you have mobility issues uh, within this, education, a key driver of this as well, and then we talked about uh, the working poor for food, uh, 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 food insecurity, um, it's, qu it's quite depressing for me and my colleagues uh, to work with people and understand they're going to go home and not have enough to eat. I can tell you, uh, no matter what I give you, what medicines we give you, what training we give you, if you do not have enough to eat, uh, your health is not going to be uh, maximized on a go-forward basis. So how do we have that conversation uh, differently? We talked about decreasing population. We know we're aging. I was so somewhat startled. In Essex County, 93, 14.7% of the population over the age of 65. Today, 22%. Right? The baby boom, we call it the silver tsunami, uh, has uh, has landed on the beaches of the Adirondack Park uh, as we go. We uh, are uh, lower income. We have more children in poverty. This is actually statistics from Franklin and Essex County. Um, we uh, have less education overall. Actually graduating a fair number from high school, not going on to secondary uh, programs. Um, higher mortality. We die more in the Adirondack Park uh, from all causes. Uh, interestingly enough, we drink about the same as the rest of the state, uh, but we drive drunk more than they do, uh, right, which is, is not appropriate uh, uh, as well. We have fewer doctors, we're less physically uh, active, and I was a little depressed about we also get a little bit less sleep, so uh, we need we, all of those things contributing to your overall health. Years of potential life lost. I just mentioned these. These you don't need to read the bottom, but uh, this is a calculation they do on um, uh, premature death. If you look at our rates in Essex and Franklin County, I compared them to Saratoga County, uh, and you can see uh, their years of life potential life loss lower. Uh, right, not that far away. Uh, just economic drivers impacting uh, their ability to live longer and healthier lives. 
So um, I'll skip over the thing, just talk a little bit about the future of care, because I'm not, I actually am a determined optimist. Uh, I, I think we have great opportunities as well, uh, and certainly there's a lot in the technological range, um, and also some challenges with that. We've got a whole new workforce coming, um, and I think that brings opportunity and challenge with us. Uh, if you haven't talked uh, to your workforces or your colleagues or your children or their friends, uh, freelancing is going to be the wave of the future, and I think that's going to bring some interesting challenges for us in terms of how do we manage uh, that workforce, how do we cover them uh, from an insurance standpoint, uh, if they're all freelancing um, on that, uh, what does uh, retirement going to look like, uh, and we know that we're going to have an even greater physician shortfall uh, into the future. But we also are going to have new types of patients. Uh, we baby boomers uh, are kind of on our way uh, forward. Um, we're really going to be talking about a whole different set of things, and when you, I talk about these things, a lot of my friends look at me like, yeah, this is, uh, uh, this is far into the future. All of these things, using genomics uh, to, to manage your DNA and your health on a go-forward basis, pharmaceuticals that are tailored to your specific DNA profiles are already on the market uh, on that. The wearable health devices uh, and the ability to remotely monitor uh, and improve your health are here. Robotic pr uh, procedures and uh, providers are here. We actually had a, a presentation from an infectious disease uh, provider uh, who would, could have been uh, robotically present in our hospital here in Saranac Lake uh, to interact with patients uh, from a distance. We weren't sure we were quite ready for that, uh, but, uh, but we are considering those technologies. Uh, there uh, remote monitoring, 3D print, uh, printable prosthetics and implants, and if you didn't see here in the news, uh, that was it two weeks ago, uh, the woman where they were able to grow an ear under her arm, under her skin, and then plant that, uh, plant that. You can start with, they're growing beating hearts now from your own uh, cells uh, that are actually beating. They haven't gotten them into the, into the full uh, transplantable thing. Already here, already uh, in our communities. And then virtual reality guided surgery. This is not just uh, uh, the, what we use in terms of scope uh, surgery. This is actually completely virtual reality that can be done uh, at a distance as well, already here. Um, so the question is, how are we, what are we going to do with it? Uh, and to me, most importantly, the kind of bottom line, who's going to pay for this? And will this drive a greater dichotomy between urban and rural, between rich and poor? Uh, doesn't have to, uh, but I think we need to come up with those answers. Um, and I think I see a slight kernel of, of hope. Uh, Medicare in, on May 8th just released its first, believe it or not, its first rural health strategy. Uh, and I think the second point, I think, is one that we all need to think about, that we have unique economics in rural areas that need to be addressed differently and with different models. And I think uh, the only way we're going to do that uh, is together uh, and as a rural community. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Bill? Yeah. As you can tell, we have three extraordinary speakers, and their perspectives are just, uh, they're synergistic, they're important. Now it's time to give you the opportunity to really ask of our panelists the questions that you think are important and the issues you think are important within the Adirondacks. First question. I know this is early in the morning, but I know there's got to be questions out there. Where's Liz. Okay. <laughs> Liz, thank you. <laughs> Just a quick question about the, the Alice model that you discussed. That referred to Clinton, Franklin, and Essex counties. Is there anything similar um, covering other counties and you know Hamilton and yeah that's Lawrence a statewide initiative so I don't have the numbers from some of the other counties but um, but they're accessible um, there is a, um, a United Way Alice website um, I can try to get you that uh, that web address but it has a lot of that information so that is being the initiatives that you're highlighting and that are being proposed are also being carried out Right. We're, the, the Alice report um, 
is is a multi-state report, but it focused on uh, New York statewide. And similar to Clinton, Franklin, Essex County, um, the numbers were alarming. Um, higher in some counties than others, but um, but certainly, you know, in New York City, there are many people who would fall into that. But their uh, solutions are going to be quite different from solutions around here. How do we change the paradigm? The paradigm in the Adirondacks. Is, is there a synergy that we can develop? Are there resources we can tap? But how do we change the paradigm? I certainly don't have uh, the answer other than I know we need to do it together. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I was thinking on my drive in this morning how depressed I would be, uh, if I'm still around, uh, to read in 2043 uh, that we have this same list of issues mm -hmm. and we haven't done more to actually change uh, the outcome on that. So we know we have to get together and we have to actually try some things uh, because I think uh, we're really good, certainly in my industry, on talking things to death. So how do we actually put some pilots out there? How do we get some investment in those pilots? How do we uh, identify if they work and if they're effective, uh, and then keep investing in those lines uh, and not keep changing horses midstream on those. So, uh, good morning. Um, Peter Bauer, Protect the Adirondacks. So, you know, I, I look at a lot of data as it comes through, news reports as they come through about the state of rural America. And one of the things that jumped out recently is, you know, the, the, the difference in the growth of jobs in rural America versus metropolitan America since the Great Recession. In rural America, we are, we are still 750,000 jobs fewer. Uh, from 2009 today, whereas metropolitan America has replaced all the jobs they lost and gained another 10 million. So we're in this massive shift with population and employment towards metropolitan areas in the country. You know, 50% of the U.S. basically has a population density similar to the interior Adirondacks of a couple people per square mile. Um, it seems like everything that you guys talked about today is consistent with the larger trends of rural America, which are not positive. They're not headed in the right directions. And I guess, you know, I don't know what the silver bullet is. Um, I'm not sure that the silver bullets are out there for rural America, but you know, what, what are some of the factors you would see for trying to buck the larger national trends that are, have been decades in the making uh, to try and you know, preserve, and this is not just an Adirondack issue, this is an upstate New York issue, but it's also all across the, 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 the northern, the rural parts of the Northeast as well. So you know, in your experiences, are there any particular items, particular uh, uh, success stories that you can point to to say, here are some things that we can build on to possibly soften this trend? One of the things, just, you know, there, there was a rural sociologist out of, out of Iowa who talked about um, uh, you know, developing smart strategies for communities with declining populations and that we can decline smartly because we're not going to be able to stop the decline given the demographic shifts and that sort of thing but we can build stronger communities with fewer people and that sort of thing so are there other things out there that you see i think kathy's going to address that for you well i i wish i had the answer i mean we're all struggling with this and as you said it's a global issue um and a lot of smart people are trying to figure it out i think there are a few things that we need to address first of all um, I think we do need to do what we can to stop the decline. Um, part of that, which we didn't touch on today, is infrastructure. Um, there are, in today's world, there are ways to make a good living and have a, um, a, a um, good lifestyle in a place like the Adirondacks, but the infrastructure needs to be there. And there has certainly been some work recently um, in trying to bring that here. And so it's things like technology, certainly. Um, it's things like transportation transportation, which isn't there up here in my opinion. Um, it's things like health care and education. So I th um, you can, I think, uh, shift the decline um, if you have those kinds of things. Um, there are some global examples of that um, in China. Uh, there's been 
some good work to support small local entrepreneurs um, where they can really thrive as small local entrepreneurs and maintain their rural lifestyle. And I think we have a lot to learn from each other. And actually at Paul Smith's, um, we, are, we have a process underway to really uh, see what we can do to add to that dialogue because there are some good best practices out there. And I, I, touching on what Kathy mentioned earlier, I think uh, education is really key. Um, I think that uh, there are some really interesting initiatives uh, in workforce skills development among instit institutions of higher learning um, that can make it more attractive for some businesses to relocate up here. I know Clinton County in particular has really been focused on that with things like the Norsk Titanium move into the area. Um, but we have to have the workforce here in order to support those and make it attractive. I think part of the infrastructure we need throughout the region is that uh, broadband wireless infrastructure that is going to make it uh, possible um, to do 21st century commerce and, and work. Um, it's difficult. I'm not sure that, you know, n I don't think any of us have the magic bullet, um, but we know that we have to be looking to the future. I was just at a conference and it was really more about um, public broadcasting, but part of the uh, thing that struck me is that, you know, none of us want to be Kodak, you know, and that none of us want to, you know, look at the way that things have always been and say that's the way, that's what we want to be. Uh, the Kodak story, of course, is that uh, they were presented the option of getting into digital photography right at the outset and they said, no, we're a film company. <laughs> And um, if nothing else, that's something we have to really look at. I think in our area, and you know, certainly the governor, I, I was here just a, um, a few months ago to talk about tourism opportunities in the Adirondacks. I think that's a wonderful aspect. Um, that has helped, um, I was actually born in Montana. That's helped Montana's economy to a degree. They have their own struggles. Um, but again, we come back to getting back to the uh, issues of, of um, Alice families, you know, how are we going to attract the people who are going to make that tourism economy go? Um, because we don't have enough people to make that work right now. So. Yeah, the only thing I would add, you know, is uh, I think we also have to change uh, change the, the rhetoric, if you will, because you know what, there are jobs in the Adirondacks. There are good paying jobs. I can't fill uh, a number of the positions that I have that are good paying jobs, uh, uh, but it gets back to education and a trained workforce. So I think having people understand that you can, ha I was kind of depressed, there was some coverage uh, from some of the students uh, from Vermont who were th saying, well, you know, I can't develop uh, within uh, the, this rural area. and I thought, oh yes you can, uh, you can go remarkable places and I think we uh, overall need to A, change that dialogue. And then I do think the entrepreneurial side of it, I think we, uh, I've been in economic development my whole career because I've been in uh, uh, rural healthcare my whole career and the reality of it is the huge factories are not going to come to our areas. I think we need to understand that it's really around what is the new economy, what is the new uh, business model uh, which is in and around uh, entrepreneurs uh, and startups. Uh, and supporting uh, those folks that have those great ideas and putting those together. Um, but without broadband and without connectivity, we're, we're going to struggle to be competitive in that market as well. And transportation. And transportation. <laughs> Neil, can we do one, one more quickie? Sure. Absolutely. Just a, a, a question, just thinking about a new paradigm or maybe an old paradigm revisited with a, some new twists on it. I'm, I'm Generation X and I have a I'm closer to 50 years old than I am 40, and I have an 11-year-old daughter and an 8-year-old son. Um, and I, I got out in the workforce and got after a career in the Adirondacks and been fortunate, my wife and I, to stay here. But why is it that our young people that are going through schools here couldn't also receive more messaging on the opportunity that family provides and the joy of family uh, so that they can also get a livable wage when they are progressing through a college education, but also start a family younger and move through life with their family. Why, why is it we don't hear more of that from our politicians as well? Opportunities for that. Sylvie, do you want to take that one, Ron? 
Um, I'm a huge proponent. Uh, we do have a, a, an OBGYN program at the hospital, and a, I do think, uh, you know, but it, to me it's even broader than that. It's growing our own, right? Uh, growing uh, certainly family and community. Uh, and again, I do think we have something very special here. Uh, and I hear that from people. It's like the Adirondacks are a special place, right? You guys have told me this, uh, and, and I believe it. So how do we help people see that family and community are what makes this special uh, for us? And I, and I do think uh, kind of highlighting that um, uh, we, I don't think we can turn our back on all the challenges we have, uh, but I tell people I'm a, I'm a self-proclaimed determined optimist, uh, and, and I do think we can change that dialogue uh, uh, for us as well. I, I completely agree, and I think that's part of the, you know, we consider ourselves storytellers, and a big part of our focus is telling the stories of people who are here and what a wonderful and um, interesting place it is to live. Um, so. Yeah, and I, I think also we need to educate people starting long before high school that there are lifelong opportunities up here. Um, I think oftentimes people, uh, students go away to school, those that are, that are going, so either they stay in poverty, if they're staying here, many of our, as our data shows, um, or they go away to school and um, they don't see the professional as well as the uh, community opportunities um, to come back. They have heavy debt loads, the uh, salaries tend to be more depressed, um, in some rural areas. So if you start that educational process early, there are certainly jobs. I mean, we have a lot of un, unpaid good jobs, or unfilled uh, good jobs too. We just need to educate people that they're there. Marketing I, is important. We need to showcase what we have. I mean, what, what, do, what do younger people want? You know, family is, in, is an important part, but it's also things to do. There are things to do in this area. Um, I'm not sure we, we celebrate that enough. And I think that's a really important part of um, really everybody's role is to really celebrate what's great, what's going on. Lake Placid Center for the Arts has wonderful things going on all the time. You know, um, we, we, we need to trumpet that sort of thing. I, I have one idea. What if the Health Center got together with Paul Smith's and start a program in environmental health. The World Health Organization says 90% of all disease either has an environmental vector that is causative or an environmental vector that aggravates in a, a pre-existing pre disease. It might be an interesting combination, may add value and set a uh, imprimatur on this area as being a focal point of that kind of work. Well, we're we're going to now title it the Neil Murphy uh, Healthcare Program because uh, we are we are actually this year launching a program focused on human health and the environment. Oh, fantastic! Thank you. It's it's been a delight. Thank you all. Thank you. Learn so much about these things. Thank you. That was fun.